Hi get everyone, Steve Jones along with Todd Sadowski, Phil Gross. We welcome you to Blue White Tailgate presented by Rich Coast Coffee. And now it's time for the Big Ten season. And guys, after last week's eventful week, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, Phil, you're probably already seeing the fruits of what happened last week with the NCAA. Who, whoever expected to what took place last week with the, with the NCAA and recruiting has really picked up. And I'll tell you, the next three weeks, relative to Penn State football recruiting is going to be very, very interesting. And Ryan Snyder, my staff, is going to be a very, very busy guy. Well, it's about time he worked. All right, so let's uh, take a look at the full screen here as to uh, how it played out. And again, the reminder, they can go to 20, but 22 is what Phil's talking about because of uh, some gray shirting. 75, 80, and then the full boat in the 16th season. That's, uh, again, that's great, and that uh, that's exactly what they needed. That 85 must be a good-looking number for Coach O'Brien <laughs> and his staff as they try to get that full complement of scholarships back a lot sooner than they expected. And as Phil said, they can start addressing those needs and, and get a lot of kids to fill those needs now. Sounding off with Bill O'Brien presented by the Family Clothesline. He talked about his team going through the bye week. It was important for everybody, you know, for everybody, coaches included, to to take a, a step back and, and analyze everything and also for our guys to be able to practice without the, the pressure of having a game on Saturday and then to be able at the end of the week to go home. No question about that. And while Phil and I rested during the bye week, we forced you to work during the bye week. Yeah, well, absolutely. Just took a little look back. It was a quick look back because it's only been four games so far for Penn State. But kind of where are they now type of deal. And the season started in Syracuse. And it starts with a true freshman, Christian Hackenberg, introducing himself to Nittany Nation. You know, I think that as a team, we did well executing. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things we got to improve on, and uh, we're going to continue to do that. He debuts against Syracuse with a lot of humility and a rocket arm. This strike to Eugene Lewis puts the game on ice and backs up the hype with which he arrives in Happy Valley. The QB competition is no more. Hackenberg is the clear choice for Bill O'Brien. You know, I think he's a confident kid. I think he believes in himself, believes in his teammates. And uh, he's got great poise. He made some mistakes today, but you know there's a lot to build on. He is wise to build on his relationship with all everything wide receiver Allen Robinson. This day belongs to the three-headed monster at running back with Zach Zwinak, Bill Belton, and Akeel Lynch sharing the carries and the spotlight. Lynch was especially happy to visit the end zone in the 45-7 drubbing of Eastern Michigan. I was like, no way I'm going down, no way, I'm too close. So then I dove and I kept my balance and I dove and I got in, I seen the ref, it was a touchdown. I was like, <laughs> I kind of panicked, I was running around. And when I got to the sound, I was gassed. The secondary is gassed after the game in week three. Central Florida's passing offense slices up the PSU pass defense at Beaver Stadium. The score says 34-31, but the Knights are in control this afternoon and convince the Lions much work needs to be done. Losing's brutal. You, you do not want to lose. Losing, you know, it's uh, it's just not a it's it's just not a good feeling. But what you have to do as a coach and as a player is in this sport is you have to immediately pick yourself right back up. The defense dusts themselves off and shines in a shutout the next week against Kent State. They hold the Golden Flashes to just nine first downs and finish the non-conference schedule three and one. Now well rested, the players are full of promise and taking advantage of opportunity. Yeah, we got a lot of talented guys, uh, especially talented young guys on our team. So it's good to see guys out there practicing hard and things like that and getting opportunities to kind of move up. Coach O'Brien is working those young guys. And I think what I take away from those first four weeks and what he said in that piece is losing is brutal. And you could just see it in his face. Yeah. I mean, he does, he's a competitive guy he does not like to lose and uh, he's doing everything he can he's utilizing that bye week to rectify any problems they had the first four weeks no question and then when it comes to Indiana unfortunately for them that's been their reaction every game in this series look at the series between the two and you can see it's been all Penn State uh, including uh, last year's shootout at Beaver Stadium and uh, for Bill O'Brien Indiana's uh, really it's going to be a tough test he knows to get the Big Ten rolling have to be able to get lined up communicate properly and handle the tempo. And then they have some really good skilled players. You know, they're, they, they get you in, into situations where you're going to have to make plays in space. And, and so handling the tempo and be, being able to tackle in space 
um, and not give up a ton of X plays, you know, explosive plays is a, is a big part of the game plan. And the X plays, that's the key right there, Phil. Yeah, Penn State uh, and against Indiana, the series, not only going to be entertaining, yeah. but you're, you're right. Penn State, to be successful in this game, got to stop the big plays of Indiana's offense. And one of the keys to the game as well will be how Penn State's offense performs. How long can they keep Indiana off the field? At the same time, can they put Indiana down by two scores? The offense plays a big role, and when we come back, we'll take a look at the offense on Blue White Tailgate. Welcome back to Blue White Tailgate presented by Rich Coast Coffee. Now, this is the point where it says here on our rundown, offensive discussion. I like to point out that we are three very offensive guys. <laughs> so, but, Phil, so far the offense has, has found some gears at times. When Christian Hackenberg rolls, he rolls. Yeah, no question about that. But what I really felt good about after coming out of the non-conference schedule, Steve, was the balance they started to show in the, in, in the game against Kent State, rushing for 287 yards in that football game. I think that was important. And Bill O'Brien made a point about that, that he needs to develop a balanced offensive attack. Now let's get to the what we call our drive of the month of the non-conference season, brought to you by Stocker Chevrolet, located across from the Better Pike on the Nittany Mall, right near the Nittany Mall. Here it is. It's against Syracuse. They finally get Allen Robinson into the mix in the second half after he sat out the first half. So he takes that screen and he moves downfield. So what the heck? That works so well. Why do they say we just go up top? A little pump fake. And there he is. Cuts to the inside. He's a master at this. His ability to take it to the inside in the open field. And in space, he's outstanding. Our Stocker Chevrolet Drive of the Month. But in yeah, we just talked about in space with Indiana. In space, he's a big problem for anybody. Absolutely, and an instant spark for that particular game. The offense was kind of stuck in the mud, and when Allen Robinson came in, they got the ball in his hands. That was that instant spark that both the team and Christian Hackenberg needed. Remember, that was his very first game. So it was nice to get somebody the ball quickly and make something happen on offense. And we think a tone setter in a lot of ways because after that, that comfort level of having Robinson in there made a big difference. All right, let's take a look at the conference so far where everything ranks to this stage. Penn State's offense right now. Yeah, okay, points. Okay, there you see rushing, but then you see red zone efficiency. Number one, Phil. They get inside the 20, they score. You know, sometimes statistics can be deceiving, and you that with their offensive production. I think they've done really, really well. But you're right. That's a major improvement over the 2012 season, Steve. They're doing a, the perfect job, you know, in, in the red zone. They got, and especially against Indiana, they got to put the ball in the end zone. Okay, now let's get to uh, Christian Hackenberg. Our good friends at Wahoo Fox 27 in Virginia had an opportunity to get us a little better look at Christian Hackenberg. Like any coach, it, it, it's kind of like watching your own kid go play. It, it's kind of cool. I mean, it's a lot of people, not, I don't know if a lot is the correct word, but people doubted his ability, doubted his, you know, commitment, his choice. And I, I think Christian's proved them all wrong. Are you surprised at all? No, I, I always thought that given the opportunity, unless there was, you know, somebody really, really good, that he was going to be the guy that played at Penn State real quick just because he's so competitive and he's smart and he's unbelievably athletic. What's it been like from that first day he showed up watching him to where he is now? A lot of fun. I mean, to tell anybody that, that I knew, you know, if, if I'm that smart, guys, I, you can tell everybody I'm, I'm going into the recruiting business. Uh, you know, Christian was a tall, skinny Eight, uh, excuse me, 10th grader and it was a great athlete and just grew and grew and got better and got better and it was fun to watch. It really was a lot of fun. What, what kind of potential do you think he has? I, I think, and I, I explained this to somebody not too long ago, with, without an injury, you know, it, no, no injuries, I, I think the, the sky's the limit. I mean, he's an unbelievable athlete. He, like I said, he's very smart. He works extremely hard uh, and he's competitive as the day is long and what a lot of, he's a tough guy and he'll stand there and he'll get better every week. And he's shown you that he was better the second week than he was the first week. What I find interesting, guys, is that I think with Christian Hackenberg, we're the only, they've only scratched the surface. Oh, I think he has unlimited potential, Steve. He's 6'4", he's 225 pounds. And I just remember what Trent Dilfer said after the Elite 11 camp. 
he is probably as gifted mentally a quarterback coming out of the high school level that he's ever had the opportunity to be around. By the way, our Offensive Player of the Month, not Christian Hackenberg. Believe it or not, it, it is Allen Robinson. And certainly, we're talking about Allen Robinson. When we're talking about him, we're not talking about the best receiver on the team or the best receiver in the conference. We could put him in the conversation, Ty, as the best receiver in the country. Absolutely. I mean, pick an area of, that you look for in a wide receiver. Does he have good size? Yes. Can he go up and catch the ball? Yes. Does he have excellent speed? Absolutely. And my favorite, yak. Yards after the catch, right? You talked about that ability to break it to the inside. He can go any direction and make defenders miss after he catches the ball. And when you have that much going on, on as a wide receiver, uh, you've got a future in the game. And we love Yak because that's what we do for a living. <laughs> all right, so let's get to the Penn State tight ends now. Last year, the tight ends were all the rage at Penn State. Now look at the you know, they're slowly Phil mixing them in. And I think it's just a comfort level for Christian Hackenberg seeing the field better each game. You know, I, I agree with you. I think that's part of it, but I think people should be a little bit patient. The tight ends, they came in the season with five guys at that position coming out of the, of the, of the non-conference schedule. They really only had two guys, Jesse James and, and, and Kyle Carter, that were 100% that were healthy, and, and Carter was not really that healthy. You know, uh, for a couple of games, he got hurt in the game against Syracuse. So that played a lot into the equation why the tight ends weren't as explosive and a bigger part of the offense as they were last year, Steve. Todd, a, a couple of shows earlier, you did a nice package where you looked at the offensive line. We've now watched them develop. Remember the first game, I was like, what's wrong with the offensive right. line? Nobody's right. asking that now four games in. Right. First off, thanks for the compliment. I know you don't throw those out very easily, but I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Squeeze the palm, <laughs> grease the palm. <laughs> but, no, you're, you're absolutely right, though. And you look at two of the four games, the Lions have really just run over their opponents, Eastern Michigan and against Kent State. They really got all three running backs involved, and none of them get involved without the offensive line opening up some holes. So that initial concern has kind of been squashed a little bit. The offensive line's done a really nice job. They are going to be tested a lot more, though, in the Big Ten schedule. There's no doubt about that, so it's going to be interesting. But when you talk about the tight ends, why aren't they catching the ball more often? Well, it's because they can really run the football. And when you're running the football, you don't have to find those tight ends quite as often. You talk about running the football, of course, it's Axe, one act, Bill Belton. And then there's this guy, Akil Lynch. Akil Lynch has stepped in. He's played pretty well. Just gelling, you know, first game is obviously get the first game, jitters out of the way. And then as you get playing and you get used to the environment, you start seeing holes and the game starts slowing down a little bit. And once the O-line gels, we start gelling with the O-line. It just becomes like clockwork. So now the question is, you know, against Indiana, how important, Phil, is this running game to controlling the clock and the tempo of the game? I think it's one of the key factors in this football game. Penn State's offense has got to find a way, and they got to use the running game to keep Indiana's offense off the football field and eliminate maybe all those big type of plays that they're able to do on offense. And Akeel Lynch, I think, is really the perfect supplement you know, to, to Zach Zwinak and Bill Belton. And now let's get to Bill O'Brien about tempo against Indiana. And some people may get obsessed with it. He doesn't. I think we can come out of this game with a bunch of field goals. You know, I think, you know, again, we, we, we've got to score points in this game. And, uh, uh, but we also have to do it in, in, in mixing tempos. We can't, we can't go into this game thinking we're just going to go warp speed every, every drive. It's not just going warp speed every drive. You also can't take it and, and, and take it and grind it down either. I mean, I think he has to call his game. And that's good recognition for a head coach. So sometimes you see offenses, they're looking for a certain number of plays. They want to keep that warp speed, as he mentioned, every single drive. And Coach O'Brien talked a lot about it at his press conference. He wants to recognize how often his defense has been on the field. Does he need to slow it down a little bit, give those guys a breather? Doesn't want to go three and out. Does he need to pick up the pace to keep Indiana's defense off, the, off track? So he's going to mix it up. He's good at it. Indiana's offense, by the way, averaging 20.2 seconds per play through four games. Coming up, the Penn State defense and what they need to do as we continue on Blue White Tailgate Show, presented by our good friends at Rich Coast Coffee as we continue right after this.
Welcome back to Blue White Tailgate. We mentioned in the previous segment we can be a bit offensive. This is where we get a little defensive with you. All right, let's uh, let's. Where is the defense right now? That's where we're going to talk about at this stage. And we're going to start out and kind of give you a picture of what three games look like versus UCF. This is very interesting how we put this together here for you uh, on the full screen, and that is, you know, what they've looked like in that game, and then the other three games. Todd, it's shutdown time. Look at the yards rushing. I mean, they gave up 219 to UCF, only 62 the rest of the games, and then the yards passing obviously almost double yeah. for UCF, and that sack number. They didn't get to UCF and Blake Bortles at all, and uh, that's going to be important as we get into the Big Ten season. Maybe not so much this week against Indiana because they get rid of the ball so quickly, but obviously getting to the backfield is, is something that's going to be imperative all year. Phil, where is the defense? You know, uh, you're really going to find out – how the young cornerbacks have kind of matured in this football game because Indiana has some big play specialists, especially with their wide receivers. And I'm, I'm really interested to see what type of package defensively Penn State comes out with because you talked about, Todd, how Indiana likes the three-step and the five-step drop and gets the ball out very, very quickly. So really, a lot of emphasis is going to be on how the young cornerbacks, Williams and, and Jordan Lucas, play in this football game. Guy like Deion Barnes important in any, any game. He talked about the bye week and the importance as they get ready for the Big Ten schedule. I'm going to watch all three games, matter of fact, all four games, and see what my flaws is and, and, and go out and practice and make sure, you know, I'm, I'm cleaning those things up and uh, getting with Coach Day and getting with the rest of the line, seeing what we can do to be better and more dominant. And this could be a game where wingspan off the edge means something. Yeah, no doubt. Look, we talked about maybe they're not going to get in the backfield. Get your hands up. The other thing right. I want to see is the lateral movement for the linebackers because Indiana's going to try and stretch the field immediately with quick passes to the outside. So lateral movement's going to be a big deal. Even the run plays, they're going to run some stretch plays just to get Penn State's defense moving. So we're going to check out their quickness, check out their coverage, and check out lateral movement against Indiana. And it goes right into linebacker because our defensive player of the month is the leader in tackles on this team, Glenn Carson, with 29 tackles so far, and he's played very well. Uh, he's played very well against the run. Here he is against Syracuse. Look, he just plugs the hole up, and that's how he's been playing at a very high level. But he has improved so much in this area right here, dramatically better as an every-down linebacker. And against Indiana, that's something Indiana hasn't seen a lot of, every-down linebackers at all three spots, which we'll touch on a little bit later here in this in the segment so I mean that's what Glenn Carson's done so far in the season and as for Glenn Carson he's been uh, really you know pleased with how they play but he knows it's a big test we got a really special group I think we got a lot of guys that love to compete and, and love the game of football and um, you know they're, they're a bunch of tough guys so I really enjoy playing with the, this team and, and this defense every down linebackers are important it's something Indiana hasn't really seen yeah, and I'll tell you, I think Glenn Carson probably is the most pr improved player on Penn State's defense. And you really pointed out the area that I was really impressed with, Steve, is his play uh, and ability to get back in the zone with his drops to defense the pace. That's something that he lacked last year, and that's why he's become an every-down linebacker, Steve. Guys, just imagine how good he's going to be with a healthy Michael Hall, if we can keep Hall in there, because Carson's had to do this without Michael Hall. Yeah. No question. That's a great point, Todd. Now, the secondary. Trevor Williams knows they're about to be tested, but he thinks they're ready. Powerful guys. We take pride in what we do. Um, the D-line, they do a great job uh, up front. The linebackers do a great job. And everyone on this team is take pride in just, just doing their job. That's all we can do. And they are about to be tested. But another key area in this game is going to be special teams. Jesse Della Valley's performed very well for Penn State. We know what Sam Ficken has done so far. Andrew Callista with a look at the Nittany Lions on special teams. 2012 was a dreadful year for Penn State on special teams, as the Nittany Lions ranked no higher than ninth in any Big Ten category. But winds of change have blown in in 2013, and the Lions have seen marked improvement across the board. No improvement has been bigger than Sam Ficken, 7 of 8 with his only miss being from 57 yards. And this Beaver Stadium record, 54 yarder. You know, Sam has kicked the ball, you know, he's, it's been uh, just fantastic the way he's kicked the ball. I think that was the longest field goal since the 70s, and uh, that's a heck of a kick. A return game is vital for an offense. 2012 saw Penn State struggle on kick returns. But with Geno Lewis back deep, Penn State has climbed out of the abyss of the Big Ten rankings. 
you know, one of the things he said about kick, the kick returner himself is you can't stutter step. You've got to hit it and uh, make one cut and go, and, and Derek's exactly right. And so, you know, that, on that particular one, that's what Gino did, and, and uh, you know, that's what we have to continue to develop. Again, the guys need to block a little bit better around them, but, you know, there, there, there was a lot of improvement on that. We saw against Syracuse what a long Jesse Del Valley punt return can lead to, as Hackenberg found the aforementioned Lewis on a TD strike. Del Valley has Penn State close to 12 yards per return this season, almost double than what it was in 2012. Yeah, that's that's something that I'm always trying to do is break one. I think every punt returner will tell you that. But um, other other than taking it to the house, I'm, I'm really just trying to get good uh, possession, field possession for our offense, and that's something that's really important to our team too, is that our offense can get the ball in a good spot on the field so they can start their drive. The Lions' main concern heading into conference play has to be punting. Last year, Alex Butterworth was 11th in the Big Ten. This year, 9th, only averaging 37 yards per kick. He really does. He, he comes to work every day, and I don't mean to uh, say that he's punting poorly. I just think he's inconsistent. I think we, we have to get him to be more consistent. I have to get him to be more consistent because he can boom in practice, and then I've seen him do it in a game, 45-yarder, 46-yarder, and then he's got the 32-yarder. You know? O'Brien knows that special teams won't win a game on their own but they sure can lose one. Coming off a of bye week, look for these units to be extra special out in Bloomington. For the Blue White Tailgate Show, I'm Andrew Callista. Phil, they seem like they have a better feel all the way through. Guys returning the, the ball for this team have a better feel as to how to return it. Uh, no question. And I think probably in this game, as the, as the season progresses, Steve, I think a key individual on pe special teams, especially on the kickoff returns, is a guy named Eugene Lewis. Yeah. I think he can make some big plays. they got to get the ball in his hands a little bit more. Now I'm going to go to an underrated guy in all this. It's a guy named Von Walker. When Eugene Lewis returns the ball, as Phil said, who's the lead blocker taking him in? It's Von Walker, and he'll block. And he's also very good in communication back there with Jesse Della Valle as well. They've done well on special teams. Coming up, our recruiting segment. It's amazing how that's become even more important in the last week as we continue <laughs> on Blue White Tailgates. We are back on the Blue White Tailgate. Now it's time to talk recruiting, sponsored by Central Pennsylvania Dock and Door. And Phil, we mentioned the sanctions have been gradually, the scholarships gradually restored. Give us the exact number. What can they go for coming up in the next class? Well, they've been at, allowed to add five scholarship players. That's 20. But in actuality, uh, Todd, they're going to be able maybe to go to 23 because they can bring three guys, you know, in in January. you got Michael O'Connor, the quarterback from Florida, coming in in January. Antoine White, the defensive lineman uh, from Millville, New Jersey. And if they can find another guy, they can add one more to that list. So that would give them 23 possible recruits in January and June. So if you're Bill O'Brien and his staff, you can look all of a sudden at your list and go, ooh, we can expand this list a little bit. It opens up a lot more recruiting and we can address those needs. So let's talk about some of those need areas. Well, what it does, it kind of focuses in with the extra scholarships. You know, they were limited with the offensive linemen and defensive linemen and maybe even linebackers that they could take in this recruiting class. Now that's become the major priorities. Instead of one offensive lineman, now they can maybe bring in three. Defensive linemen, they wanted to bring in two, and now with the extra scholarships, they'll be able to bring in those two scholarship guys. And at the linebacker position, they wanted to take even two or three because, you know, Hull graduates after next season – and Glenn Carson is going after this season. So now they can maybe get three linebackers, especially two definitely, with the class of 2014. Do they have some guys that they're targeting specifically, and how close are they with these particular guys? Well, at the top of the defensive line group is Thomas Holly, the kid we've talked about from Abraham Lincoln High School in Brooklyn, New York. And then there's a kid they're going to get back involved with on the defensive line, a kid named Ricky Walker from the Hampton, Virginia area. And it's interesting, Ricky Walker will be at the Michigan game in a couple of weeks. And along the offensive line, they got Alex Bookshire, the guy from Mount Lebanon High School in western Pennsylvania, now is back on the, on the screen. And there's an interesting case. People are wondering how much Penn State will be able to get back involved with kids that they weren't able to recruit that they might have offered in the springtime. And there's a kid named Alex Eberly, a kid from 
uh, Mechanicsburg, Virginia, who some people consider to be one of the top four wide, uh, excuse me, four uh, center prospects in the offensive line, and he's now committed to Florida State. It'll be interesting to see they've contacted him whether they can back and recruit that type of individual. Yeah, some of those guys that were on the fringe now they might be back in play. And you mentioned that Michigan game. That's going to be an interesting night. There's going to be a lot of recruits in town. Oh, boy, uh, Ryan Snyder, my staff, is, go is going crazy, <laughs> I'll tell you, Todd. Because it may look like for the class of 2014, 2015, and 2016, and maybe even a few freshmen sprinkled in, they could have close to 100 kids on, on the campus for that Michigan homecoming football game, Todd. Well, a good performance that night certainly will help the cause. Let's take a look at our Health South injury update. Pretty clean list coming off the bye week. Ryan Kaiser is out in the secondary. Indiana loves to throw the ball, so that could hurt them in the secondary. Mike Hall will play, and that is going to help the linebacking core tremendously. Coach O'Brien, nothing but positive things to say about Mike Hall. So it's great to have him back there in the linebacking court. Uh, I think that's a real key for this football game against Indiana, Doc. Okay. And when we come back, we're going to talk about Indiana. This is a team, when they go on the road, they play the Nittany Lions tough. It's usually within a touchdown, isn't it? And you score a lot of points. Yeah, they're going to score a lot of points, no doubt about it. So we're going to see. We're going to break down the offense. We're going to break down the defense as well. Their defense, well, it's, it's not so good. Their offense is definitely dangerous. A lot of things are going to be important, including red zone efficiency, all those types of things. We're going to talk about it when we come back, come back on the Blue White Tailgate. Time now to talk about Indiana football and uh, Indiana football over the years has had its ups and its downs and Kevin Wilson's trying to resurrect all of it coming off really their best recruiting year ever and this is what he's done so far. Yeah, 7-21. and 21. I'll say this guys, if you're going to struggle along the way, you might as well be entertaining and Phil, he does have an entertaining football team. Uh, that's, that's the part that you really should look for in this game. Indiana is going to score some points. Penn State's not going to completely shut them down. And they have a great group of wide receivers. I think as a group, it may be the best in the entire Big Ten. I, the statistic that kind of amazed me is all five or six of their wide receivers all average at least 50 yards per catch. And that, that's an amazing number. And again, they can dial it up, and you have to be wary. You cannot turn the ball over against this No, team. absolutely not. And when you saw what Coach Wilson does and where he came from, anybody that knows college football, you come from Oklahoma, the way that they've played football there for the past decade, you know they're going to play up-tempo. And Coach O'Brien mentioned in this week's press conference, he does a good job of getting to 90 and 100 plays a game. And, Steve, you mentioned 20 seconds a play. Yeah. So don't look away because the next play <laughs> yeah. is coming from the Hoosiers. 20.2 seconds of play through four games so far. Nate Sudfeld or Trey Roberson? Not sure yet, but Sudfeld really has been the primary trigger guy. You can see what he's done so far. Already 1,146 yards, 11 touchdowns, the five picks. One that was very damaging against Missouri. Yeah, he, he made a big mistake in that football game and kind of completely turned the whole situation around. He's a big kid. He's about six foot five. As you said, 230 pounds. He's a pro-style quarterback. It really fits into the system that they, that they use. It'll be really interesting, though. They're not going to know if they start him or Trey Robinson. And Trey Robinson brings a completely different look to the Indiana offense, Steve. And what about putting pressure on? Deion Barnes talked about what Penn State has to do here. Um, it's very important, you know, we got to put a pressure on that guy. Um, you know, they do a lot of quick passes in the scene last year, and they very, they very fast, you know. I mean, last year they ran about eight play, I like a play every eight, eight seconds. So, you know, we got to get, get conditioned for that and make sure we're right for that one. It's 20.2, Dion. It, I mean, I, I know out there it feels like it every eight seconds. Like I know it seconds. feels like every eight seconds. Especially for defensive linemen, they got to get set that but quick. Jack Cam called me up. He says, am I going to be able to talk at all? I said, yeah, yeah, it's okay. We'll get, we'll get you in there. Glenn Carson, though, says there is an area of familiarity. We'll get to that in a moment. But first, the tail of the tape. Let's rack it up. Tail of the tape between the two right there. You can see in, in yards, points, the whole thing. Uh, it's really a great contrast between the two. Glenn Carson says that's one thing that they have compared to the Central Florida game. At least they have seen and lived through this before. 
Analyzing. It definitely helps for uh, the veterans that, that have played some, as well as you know the coaches that are familiar with the teams. And also you have that game film, which is pretty precious from the, the years past if they still uh, have the same offensive um, game plan and things like that. So it helps a lot. Okay, so Phil, Todd and I don't want anything to do with this part. How do they slow them down? <laughs> <laughs> like you control the football. You, you have a balanced offensive attack. There's no question about that. Penn State's offense must control the tempo of this football game. And that's the way you control an Indiana offense. You, you don't necessarily expect to shut down all their offensive talent. Got some really good talent though on the defensive side. Greg Heben in the secondary. Nick Mangieri off the edge. The true freshman T.J. Simmons in the middle and expect uh, Newton and Oliver, two other two freshmen, to maybe see some time at linebacker. They're young in some spots and unsure in some spots over there. Well, the interesting thing is they have some individual talent, but collectively they really stink. I mean, they just have not <laughs> been very good. And we were talking, what, what else can you say about the team that just over 400 yards, Phil, you were saying over 400 yards rushing they allowed against Navy. So uh, they've just, it's the kind of game, we talk about red zone efficiency, it's the kind of game, I mean, Coach Wilson, if his defense keeps a team to three points, he's cheering them when they come off the field. If they give up seven, then he has to say, all right, offense, go get those seven points back. So, you know, when they give up three points in a possession, I think that's a win for the Hoosiers defense. On defense, they really stink. I mean, that, that, that kind of astute analysis. That's what that you we, <laughs> we, <laughs> just get right to the point. Right? I said about the package before, I take it back. No, I just. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to the tail of the tape between Penn State's offense and the Indiana defense. And on, for the Indiana defense, that is one go. wild Let's ride <laughs> right there. That is a wild ride right there, without a doubt. Wow. Um, Kevin Wilson knows that the Penn State offense is something that he is very concerned about. So you look at the personnel, uh, the freshman quarterback is really solid, uh, playing in a scheme where they understand how to, to take advantage of his strengths and not stress him out as a freshman with protections and run game balance and screen and, and in their play calls and whatnot. Um, but Hack, Chris, the Hackenberg kid is a very talented young player. But at the same time, Phil, I mean, we could talk about what Indiana has not done defensively. You still have to do this offensively against them. You can't turn it over. You have to continue to put pressure on them so they continue to think that they don't play well defensively. Oh, you're right. Uh, there's, no, there's no question. Consistency. Penn State has to have consistency uh, with its offense. They can't have the big turnover. They can't let Indiana feel that, hey, we're going to get our offense back on the field and we can turn this game around. So I really believe consistency, control the ball on offense, and then you put Indiana's defense behind the eight ball, Steve. No question. Now, the other part, when you look at the stats, you'll see Mitch Ewald has attempted one field goal all year. I can tell you from past years, he actually is a really good field goal kicker. <laughs> but he's only tried one the entire season. Special teams will be important, too. They have a pretty good return game at Indiana. Coming up, my counterpart, Don Fisher, the longtime play-by-play -play voice of Indiana. I'll talk with him as we continue after this. Welcome back to the Blue White Tailgate Show. Great to have you with us. We're joined now by the outstanding play-by-play -play voice of Indiana football and basketball, my good friend Don Fisher. Don, welcome. Great to have you with us. Thanks for having me, Steve. Two up, two down. Does that indicate up and down for Indiana? It does. We're a roller coaster ride waiting to happen, and we've been that through the first four ball games, Steve. Indiana State was a blowout win for Indiana, 73 points on the scoreboard. Then they come back against Navy and can't stop them and uh, get beat by a touchdown, 41 to 35. And then they played Bowling Green, who was supposed to be a really good MAC team, and and beat them soundly. Did not give up a defensive touchdown in the ball game, so everybody thinks the defense is back on track. And and then we come up against a really good Missouri football team and get spanked. So it, it's been a roller coaster ride to this point. Uh, Year three in the Calvin Wilson era, and there's no question that defense is still a big problem. Offensively, Nate Sudfeld, Trey Roberson, what does each bring to the table, and what kind of options do they give Kevin Wilson? Well, Sudfeld obviously is the guy that uh, has become the starter at this point, uh, but Trey Roberson, and Sudfeld's the passer of the two. He's more the drop back or the, the prototypical NFL-type quarterback. 
although that's not becoming prototypical anymore. <laughs> but at the same time, Trey Roberson is that kind of guy. He's got, he can hurt you with his feet. He's a very good thrower, but not a, he's not as good as Nate Sudfeld is in the throwing department, but he can definitely uh, get out and scat and, and find ways to make people miss. So uh, they do bring different uh, uh, you know, talent, skill levels to the, to the field, but at the same time, both are capable, but Sudfeld right now is the guy, and they used both last week because uh, Wilson just felt like they needed a change-up when the offense couldn't get going in the early part of the ball game. So uh, I still think it'll be Sudfeld this week against Penn State, and, and Trey would probably see some playing time simply because they want to get him on the field when they get an opportunity. There are really on a lot of teams in the country that use their backs, I think, as well as Indiana. We know a lot about Stephen Houston. Tell us a little bit, Don, about Tevin Coleman. Well, Coleman is a guy that uh, came in last year as a freshman, did play some, but he wasn't uh, a dramatic hit initially. Uh, that said, he is probably uh, the better of the two in the sense that he can hit the hole and, and come out the front end a little bit more soundly than Stephen Houston. Houston likes to get some running room, and once he does get running room, he can lose the, usually explode on you. But And I'm talking about from a speed perspective, but... Coleman's probably a little bit harder nosed, even though uh, I think his speed is probably underrated. I think he is really quick, and he is hard to catch once in the open field as well. But both are talented. There's no question about that. D'Angelo Roberts brings a change up from the two. He's kind of a uh, not quite as quick as either one of them, not quite as fast as either one, but just as hard nosed uh, as either one. Maybe a little more hard nosed than those two. So. They've got three running backs that they use quite a bit at this point, and all three have been effective at times. But the offensive line has been the real question mark thus far, and it was supposed to be a strength, but they've had four injuries, uh, with one of them knocking a player out for the season and maybe another player out for the season as well. We don't know, but he doesn't seem to uh, be responding to treatment to his back. Peyton Eckert we're talking about at the uh, right tackle position. And so those could be two of the key players from last year that will not play this season, and that's really hurt this offensive line, and it's hurt, hurt its development. Don, has Kevin Wilson now in his third year started to develop a little more depth in the program, or is that still an issue? Well, I think, I think there is more depth. There, there's no question that the guys that he's replaced on the offensive line have done okay, yeah. but they have not really been consistent at opening holes for the running game, which has been a real uh, something they've really worked on during this bye week that they've had, and they're hoping to run the ball more effectively here starting Big Ten play. That said, the defense does have more depth, but the question is how, much, uh, how, how good is the talent level at that, on that side of the football. Uh, I think the young guys that he brought in from the recruiting class this past year, which was rated the best that's ever been in Indiana, uh, I think that young talent is starting to take hold a little bit, and we're seeing more and more of those guys getting more playing time. And it is a deeper group, but they're still shy talent-wise on the defensive side of the football. They still need more speed, and they need some defensive linemen. Even though they're young right now, they need some of these guys to step up and become more consistent. Yeah, and that was you know, several guys across. But Greg Heben's still a big-time player for them. He's, he still played very well back there. Uh, yeah, he had two yeah. picks last week in the ball game at safety, and, and he is such a steady yeah. performer. He, he's not the most talented athlete on the football field, but he is as yeah. smart as anybody out there, and he does a great job of being where he's supposed to be. He's excellent. Uh, probably the biggest upgrade has been at corner where Tim Bennett, right. who was a safety, a backup safety last year, has stepped up as a corner, and he has become a physical corner presence out there. This kid's really improved, really has made his presence felt on defense this year. And uh, if there's been a real plus, it's been in his play on the defensive side. Don, always a pleasure. Can't wait to see you Saturday. Look forward to it, Steve. We're looking forward to a really good football game to start Big Ten play. Thanks so much. Don Fisher, the outstanding play-by-play -play voice of Indiana football and basketball. We'll come back to wrap up in a moment on the Blue White Tailgate Show presented by Rich Coast Coffee after this.
Boy Tailgate presented by our good friends at Rich Coast Coffee, Penn State, Indiana. Time now for a pop further review presented by the Penn State Bookstore as Fran Fisher rolls the clock back 19 years to 1994 in Bloomington. I remember my first year in the booth after a 12 year hiatus and a memorable trip to Indiana. I don't need to tell you that Coach Paterno likes to have his team staying at uh, kind of isolated hotel motel facilities. And let me tell you, we were in the boondocks. Had to wake up the desk clerk. Anyway, George Paterno, Roger Corey, Jeff Harmon, and I had two things to accomplish. Eat and record Joe Paterno for the pregame show. The first was easy, soon. And we tossed a coin to see which one of us would approach Joe about the recording time. We got her done. Joe always held court in the SID's room after the team was tucked in, cajoling the beat writers with commentary about everything but football. This night was interrupted by a visit from Bobby Knight, and the rest of the night was devoted to the merits of the basketball set shot, demonstrations and all. Gotta use two hands, Joe insisted, and Mr. Knight could not convince Joe that the jump shot was a far better weapon than the two-handed set shot. The two-hand set shot went out with your offense, Bobby proclaimed. I made that up. Yes, Penn State won the game. Didn't play really well, but won 35 to 29. This is Fran Fisher with Upon Further Review. Without a doubt, one of the more memorable nights on the road, and it was incredible. But it was also, Penn State had fallen from number one in one poll after beating Ohio right. State 63-14. Then this game, they fell out of the number one after this the late rally by Indiana to get a win in six. You know, uh, Steve, I don't think you're ever going to see that type of a situation arrive in college football today. Nobody's going to be kind and do like Joe Paterno did in that situation and bring in the second and third no. team guys. People score points. The yeah. BCS is this last year. you you got to do that to retain your position. Yeah, pedal to the floor, no doubt. Let's take a look at the top 25 for the weekend. Big games this weekend. Uh, Maryland is uh, undefeated so far. They're in the Big Ten next year. Notre Dame's at Arizona State. And, of course, you got Washington, Stanford, and Clemson is at Syracuse. Big Ten. This is going to be – the big one is going to be, obviously, the Northwestern game taking on Ohio State. That is the intriguing one. That's going to be interesting because you're talking about completely different styles there. All right, so there's the Big Ten. Phil, your keys to the game this time through. Okay, uh, you – Penn State got to control the tempo this football game. They got to find a way to limit the big plays of the Indiana offense. And when Indiana throws the ball, find a way to get some pressure on whoever the quarterback is at Indiana. For me, I think one of the keys of this game actually involves the Penn State linebackers. It's a little different look for Indiana to have every down linebackers. Everybody's throwing out nickels and dimes against them all the time. That's the look they're used to. I don't think they're used to the look that has a Mike Hall and a Stephen Obang Ajapong on the outside all the time. I think that versatility helps Penn State. And on offense, play their game. They don't have to work the clock all the time. Play their game. I think it's good enough. I like first half scoring. Indiana's led up 83 points in the first half alone. So if Penn State, that's over 20 a game. If they can get themselves to 24, maybe even 28 points, depending if they're scoring field goals or touchdowns, let, that's really going to change the way Indiana's offense has to approach the game. So I look for first half scoring to see if the Nittany Lions can score a lot right yeah. away. And again, when we talk about inside the numbers, we go back to the fact that these guys dial it up 20.2 seconds of play. That is the big number to look at in this game. But there's also the other part, too. If you go 20.2 seconds of play and you force three and outs, uh, guess what? Their offense is back on the field again within about a minute. So there's a plus and a minus to how Indiana plays. It's up to Penn State to accentuate the minus. Aaron's thanks for the furniture. Comfy. <laughs> Blue White Tailgates presented by Rich Coast Coffee. Thanks for joining us.